kinetics, we, we started with the rectilinear, so we'll do a real quick one on that just to uh, remind us a bit of what the deal was, plus uh, bring something else into it we uh, had at one time before. So imagine a couple sets of pulleys here. This one's going to get good, so, so do your very best on this one. It's easier, I think, I've just found out over the years, to draw on the pulleys first and then put in all the ropes and the like. So I'll slow it down and give you a little bit of time there. So there's the pulleys. We have a frictionless cart, that's what the wheels stand for on a 20 degree, 20 degree slope. So take a second to get the pulleys in there. Actually, I like this problem just like this. Looks like a bunch of little Martians. Put some of the other stuff while you're waiting. So, 30 kilogram cart on perfectly frictionless wheels. And this down here is 10 kilograms. Slope is 20 degrees. <coughs> and then the cord, the cable, starts from this hub, goes up over that one, over that one. Okay, caught up enough. All right, starting from rest, neglecting all friction and the mass of the pulleys. Now, in a couple weeks, we might not necessarily neglect the mass of the pulleys because not only are these masses accelerating linearly, translationally, but you're going to have to spin the pulleys up to some kind of speed, and that's going to take some of the... Uh, for some of the energy that's in the problem. But for now, we'll take the pulleys to be massless and there to be no friction in the system. So, starting from rest, we want to find then the acceleration of the two blocks in the problem. So, what do we got? Any ideas what to do? We should probably start out by noting the conservation of cable's length. Well, I don't know if we so formally called it that, but most certainly the, the length of the cable joining these, assuming uh, it's stretchless, which uh, we wouldn't assume in strength of materials, but we can still assume here. Um, assume that the length of the cables is uh, constant, so from some reference point that uh, doesn't move, we want uh, something about how the cables, or how the, uh, how uh, each of them relates to the length of the cable. So maybe call that XA and uh, maybe this XB will work. Remember, we don't have to go all the way down to the piece because none of the constants that are left over matter. 
So we don't care about this little bit of cable over there or any of the cables around the loops or the, uh, the fact that our XB is coming up a little bit short of the blocks. doesn't matter because however fast the pulleys move, the blocks themselves move as well. So then if you remember, we set up the length of the cable in terms of those. And you might pick other reference points, but I, I think that's probably as easy as anything. So it looks like we've got uh, 2XA plus 3XB plus a bunch of constants that are of no concern <coughs> because we don't actually want the length of the cable but the time rate of change of the length of the cable which of course is zero because it's constant length. So just from that then you get 2x double dot a equals minus 3x double dot b for the acceleration. Is that about where everybody got to kind of quick? Trouble is, uh, and, and by the way, of course, those are the accelerations we're looking for, just in a slightly different uh, uh, notation. Um, what's the trouble here? They're going to accelerate in the same direction as each other. No, that's not so much the trouble. Um, the, the minus sign just means if one of them is getting shorter on that side, the other one's going to be getting longer on that side. So that's no concern. But what's the trouble with solving the problem? We don't know how the acceleration is defined. We, well, yeah, we yeah. do. It's the rate, yeah. which, the rate at which these are changing. The trouble is, of course, that's two unknowns and one equation. We only have one equation. So we need a second equation that doesn't necessarily bring in any more unknowns and at least refers to one of those, if not both. Suggestions. Diagrams. Well, the only other place we've got any help, this is, this is all kinematics. The only other place we can look is at the kinetics, in other words, bringing in the, the forces in the problem. So the uh, forces are going to come in in some free body diagram. So each one of these has some weight to it. <coughs> drawing in the, the weight vectors. <coughs> what else? Tension down the cable. All right. How much? It's being applied to multiple sources. And unfortunately, it will have to probably be an unknown for the time being. Well, you guys put that in. You put the tension in on those two free body diagrams. Remember that with massless pulleys, with no friction in the system, the tension is the same everywhere in the cables. Uh, when we take into account the mass of the cable, the pulleys themselves in a little bit, the tension will not be the same throughout the cable. It will be different on one side of the pulley than the other for each and every pulley in the system. But we'll take the uh, tension to be the same in all of the cables at this time. Well, it's only one cable, but all sections of the cables. So there's clearly some effect of the tension here. If the tension in the cable is, say, T, how much is that force on block A? 
how much is this force on block B? If the tension in the cable we call T, which is unknown. Is that T? It's 2T. And this is 3T. In fact, that's the point of a block and tackle system is to get with one rope more force applied uh, when and where needed. Is that it? What about the normal force applied to block A? Block A has a normal force on it because it's in contact with the slope, so perpendicular to that. Something like that. So we're looking for the acceleration of A and B. We're not sure which direction it would be, but uh, that's the type of thing we're looking for. So we're not sure which direction, but uh, it might be something like that. It might be that they're in the opposite direction, but we do know they're related by equation one there. So we have another unknown t now in the equation, in the problem. So uh, we need not one more equation now, we need two more. We've got those two unknowns, but now we've got t as an unknown, so we're going to need at least three equations. Where else do we go for extra equations? Who's got a smartphone has the eBay app? Pick one up there. <coughs> Somebody has extra equations, they put them on eBay. No, nobody's pulling out the... Where are we going to get two more equations? <laughs> From me. I have a drawer full of them in my office. But... We don't need to go there. We're going to get two more equations. <clears throat> got three unknowns so far. T is unknown. If we had mass in the pulleys, then those two T, we wouldn't have the simplicity of T being on both sides of theirs. So where else are we going to get an equation? Well, that's one equation. So the, the mass, sum of the forces, time equals the mass times the acceleration. So there's one equation. Well, n's unknown. So do we need, where are we going to get a third? And do we need a fourth equation now that n comes into it? We sum the forces on that. N's one of the forces. We're, well, maybe let's work with this one because it doesn't happen to have a normal force in it, so that can help us a bit. 3T minus M B G equals M B X double dot B. Uh, that's pretty useful. That didn't introduce any more unknowns. Um, yeah, that's one concern. Is three T in the negative X direction? <clears throat> uh, okay. I don't. I don't. I, X B direction. Oh, with respect to this. Uh, yep. That might be an important detail later on. Uh, however, uh, these two do agree, but that would be negative, so we can put a negative in to go ahead and go with this, and that will keep this negative, the integrity of this negative as well. All right, so there's, is that a, a legitimate equation to use? No extra unknowns, but 
we're still short one unknown, at least, or one equation. Um, we can do the same for this, but we're going to have the normal force. So what's the deal? What do we do? Wait for me. Travis, you have another idea? You helped with, with that one. The normal force is an unknown in D, but it's not in the direction, it's perpendicular direction of motion, so it's not really of concern. It's not one of the equations of motion because it's not the direction in which we're moving. So if we sum the forces in the A direction, we get uh, minus 2t plus, uh, let's see, where's the 20 degrees? <coughs> That's the 20 degrees, so this is plus mag sine, sine 20. mag sine 20. Equals M A X double dot A. And that doesn't involve any new unknowns, doesn't involve the normal force, and um, does relate the, the last of the acceleration. So now you've got three equations, three unknowns. Since it's not an algebra class, I'll help you with it. But you can double check that you get these plus. I'll put them up and you interpret them for me. X double dot A is a little over one meter per second squared. X double dot B is minus 0.682 meters per second squared. And it wasn't asked for, but there it is. T comes out to be 35 newtons. So let go from rest. We'd see those accelerations in this system idealized as frictionless and with massless pulleys. <clears throat> Which way does the system actually move? Either X goes down and B comes up, or the other way around. Which is it? Going to vote for other way around, which means X goes, A goes up, B comes down. Well, if X double dot A is positive, that means X A is increasing. So, uh, from rest, then A is going to go down and B is going to go up. So as I, uh, as I hypothesize with little sketches there, um, that's indeed what it does. <clears throat> All right, questions before I clear that one? Joey, you okay with that one? Are you? Ask questions now before I raise it. Okay, that's uh, straight rectilinear coordinates. Now if we look at kinematics in curvilinear coordinates, 
again, planar curvilinear coordinates. We've got some other uh, things we can do. Planar curvilinear <coughs> coordinates, the, the kinetics of planar, planar curvilinear coordinates, uh, kinetics. The uh, equations of motion, well, if we use the Cartesian uh, coordinate system, we again have two equations uh, of motion, two equations of motion, uh, plus any of the kinematics we might want to bring in. In fact, that's true on any of these problems. To get enough equations, we often need to use both the kinetics and the kinematics. In the uh, normal tangential coordinate system, we have, uh, again, just <clears throat> two equations. But there's a little bit more opportunity for, uh, for uh, bringing in the kin kinematics if we need it, because we know that the normal acceleration is the centripetal acceleration, and that the tangential um, is the uh, time rate of change of the velocity. Because the velocity itself is always tangential. <coughs> So we can add those little bits to it. Um, could be that we know more parts to that, uh, since we can also bring in, <coughs> if, remember, this is best for known paths with some kind of curvature. That's where the row comes from. We can also add in other parts to it, such as V equals rho omega, if, uh, if we know something about how the uh, radius uh, line to the center of curvature is moving, or uh, equals r omega, or a tangential equals r alpha, or any combinations thereof, which there could be several of them, so no sense writing them all down. But that's uh, that's in normal tangential coordinates. Plus any of their kinematics, which for the most part would be something like that, or any other of the kinematics along the path itself as well. Then we had that one other coordinate system we looked at, the polar coordinate system where we have r and theta coordinates. That one is a little bit more involved in that uh, we also had a couple other directions. Uh, a, R, or a couple other components. We went through these, so not to belabor it. R double dot minus R theta dot squared, if you remember. This is uh, very good for, a, uh, for motion about a fixed point, as, as would be with a radar gun or something like that. And we set these up, uh, I guess about a week ago, we did those. So those 
polar coordinates with any of the other kinematic equations that might be needed, which could be these, but might have some other parts to it. And remember, some of these were uh, also uh, easy to tie with sometimes the X and Y notation. <clears throat> Remember this one works good for type of uh, satellite tracking problem and the plane itself, its motion might more easily be described in, in X, Y notation. So you can combine the two if needed, if and when needed. Alright, so that's, that's uh, a little bit of review, just taking what we had already and tacking it onto the F equals MA. That describes all the kinetics of what we're doing here so far. Alright, so we'll look at a couple problems now. Um, imagine a plane flying on some curved path of some kind, um, radius two miles, at least local radius two miles. Remember sometimes these are taken as the, uh, the curvature, the local curvature, even though the, the path does not have to be circular everywhere. But at some one certain particular point, it can be approximated by a circle. 400 miles per hour. And we want to find the angle at which the plane must fly around that corner. You know, if you go around a corner, oh, how should I draw? Let's see. So there's the, there's the uh, row direction, I guess. And then this direction would be Z. And if we're looking either in front of or behind the plane, we see it banking as it went around the corner. So this is, this, this is the same view, only from the back of the plane. Now as it goes around, banks around the corner. And that, that makes that kind of noise. So what we want to come up with here is given a corner, a, a, a path of that radius at that speed, what is the angle at which the plane must bank? systems we can use, Cartesian, normal tangential, or polar. The Z direct axis straight up and down isn't going to help much because all three of them could have that as its third dimension. Plus, we're not, that's just uh, part of the viewpoint of it that we need that. Generally, for curved paths, either the normal tangential or the polar coordinate systems are going to work a little bit better. The normal tangential tends to be a little bit simpler. We don't have all those extra components in there. So, if we use the normal tangential, that will be the tangential direction. Remember, the normal direction is towards the center of curvature. So that would put, then, in this picture, that normal direction in that as well. And there's the Z there.
What's next? Well, we're looking at kinetics, so uh, it's going to involve some forces. What forces are on the plane? Jump in and take the easy one first. David? Uh, the weight. That would presumably weighs something. So, whatever that might be. And I don't have anything for that. What other forces might there be? Well, there, if, if it's going in a circle, there must be some centripetal force directed towards the center of that circle or it wouldn't go in a circle. Where does that centripetal force come from? Remember the deal with forces, they all have to come from something real. We can't say there must be a centripetal force because it's going in a circle. Because there is a centripetal force, it's going in a circle. So we've got to find what causes that force. There's got to be some force directed towards the center in the end direction or it's not going to go in this circular path. Did you hear what he said? Are you going to say the same thing, David? What did you say again? We'll ask him. I'm going to say again. Um, I was wondering if it was a component of a lift that gives it the centripetal force. How does the lift act? And an angle of theta. The lift, remember, is a pressure differential between the air above the wings being a less pressure than the angle below the wings, so the lift tends to act perpendicular to the wings. There's also, of course, some drag force, but we're not going to worry about that. We're assuming that it's got its jets on and it's going to constant tangential velocity yeah, constant tangential velocity. And in fact there's the theta that we need and it's that component of the lift towards the center in the normal direction that supplies the uh, centripetal force needed to fly in a circular path. And in fact that's why they do have to bank. Because they need to turn that lift over and use some of it for the centripetal force. Now what? Any other forces other than uh, a drag and a thrust in the tangential lead, uh, tangential direction, which we'll assume just cancels each other, uh, cancels each other if it's flying at constant velocity. David? Are we to assume the plane is maintaining a constant altitude? Sure. In which case the acceleration is in, in a level, level flight, corner of flight through there. Therefore, it looks like they're 7G. Well, therefore, in other words, these are all the forces we have. <clears throat> and then you can now solve in the two coordinate directions. The tangential direction which we'll assume to be zero and isn't going to tell us anything more than the drag equals the thrust anyway, so that's not going to help us much. So we'll go to the normal direction. Any forces in the normal direction? Of course, that's not mg, but it is L um, sine theta. And remember, we're looking for theta. So that's the centripetal force there. What's that equal to? There's, there's nothing that 
balances that in the in the end direction. So what do we do? We just put in the centripetal force there. That's the component in the z direction if we break L into its two components. What must this be equal to? <laughs> This is the centripetal force, which equals mv squared over rho. We have v, we have rho, we don't have m, and we don't have l. So then what? Well, we're going to have to do the z direction, the sum of the forces in the z direction. If it's in level flight, we know those to be equal to zero. And so we can then say that uh, L cosine theta equals mg. So you could solve for L, put it in here. The M's will then cancel, which means for any plane at that speed in that kind of corner, it's going to bank uh, at whatever theta we come up with. So L is mg over cosine theta times sine theta equals mv squared over rho. So good, the m's cancel. We get uh, what, tan theta equals v squared over rho g. Units work out, is that okay? If the units don't work out, it means we screwed something up. Something else might have messed up, but at least that'll tell us if we messed up. Meters squared per second squared, meters times meters per second squared, so the units cancel. So we're okay. And all of those pieces now we've got, and so we can get the bank angle for the plane. Comes out to be, when you watch all your units, a little over 45 degrees. For that speed, that corner. Chris, that's how it came up? That's the spirit. Because we can go back and watch all the tapes and see that I don't ever do anything wrong up here. Skip things, find down on, that never happens. All right, should be uh, should be pretty straightforward. Don't forget the v. This v is in miles per hour, so you're going to need it in something else. <clears throat> Five eighty-seven feet per second would work because then all the units, if you have g in thirty-two point two feet per second squared should work out as that. Don't use 9.81 for... Yeah, we have English units. Yeah, sometimes you're looking at the harder stuff and you don't pay attention enough to the easy stuff.
Okay? All right. Uh, we'll do a related problem, only with uh, a little more uh, that we can throw into it. The first part is very, very similar to this. <clears throat> the second part uh, isn't quite. We'll throw in a little bit extra. So, oh, and this is perfect because the Daytona 500 is coming up. You know, they've got those great banked tracks on which they run. And the world will never see another Dale Earnhardt. So, there, there, we're looking at a car from the back as it goes around the great bank turn of Daytona. See you watching. No. I just... They call um, life. <laughs> I'm just always amazed following a car and they had it on there and the NASCAR stickers and they're still grieving over the loss of Dale Earnhardt, I guess, because I still see those. I don't know. That's all I know about it. Nothing more. All right. So, at a uh, track speed of 100 feet per second, Huh? And a radius of curvature of 600 feet. What is the bank angle such that friction between the tires and the road surface are not of concern. In other words, if the if the the banking was made of greasy ice, the car could still go this speed around that corner and not slide down or slide up the banking. So to maintain a 600 foot radius, what uh, banking what bank angle is required? Very similar to the last problem we did. So you uh, you kick that out. And then we're going to add to it a little bit. Just to make life miserable. Dan Danica Patrick hit the wall yesterday. Well, Go Daddy girl? Yeah. That Go Daddy woman. She's, she's better looking than Dale Earnhardt was. Apparently there's an RPI graduate female who's also on the NASCAR circuit. That's not quite to the level of Danica Patrick. But then that is all I know about NASCAR. That's the limit right there. smelling distance of the Coors Brewery, so I know what Coors Light's all about, too. All right, very, very similar to the problem we just did. So you guys check it. Uh, assuming no lift on these cars, like we had lift on the plane, so what's the difference? Where does the centripetal force come from now? Where does the centripetal force come from now? There's no lift, even though some of these, well, the NASCAR didn't have wings on them. Indy cars have wings. Well, that's because we're not afraid of spoilers. That's, those, those are for negative lift anyway. All oh, race car wings are for negative lift. Yeah. Well, I think so, unless that'd be a, a great uh, mystery novel. You know, sneak in, flip their wing over. Because the. Uh, the wing is put upside down so it increases the normal force, which increases the friction. 
which then increases the speed with which they can go around the track. So what supplies the normal force in this problem? <coughs> you drew it there. I mean, what supplies the, uh, the uh, centripetal force? Is what I mean. You kind of gave away the answer. Well, I didn't know you'd actually be listening. You guys tricked me. And That's the normal force. Yeah, it's the normal force. The normal force between the track, surface, and the car. Because there are no other forces. Uh, if we're not including then drag and, and thrust, which would be equal well, anyway if it's at constant speed around the circle. So there's our centripetal force, uh, n in the normal direction um, is the centripetal force. centripetal force for this corner. And so there shouldn't be anything left other than to solve for theta just like there was on the first problem. You got something? You got something? Looks like you guys agree. That's either comforting or scary. Depending on which one of you you are. Now, be careful when you draw that so long, it's too long to be the component of that, you'll forget that that's, that is the centripetal force, that component of the normal force. On your drawings, make sure that this normal component, the centripetal force, is uh, a legitimate component of N. Don't draw it a lot longer. Well, when you go to look at this in a couple weeks, you'll forget where the centripetal force came from. It's from the normal force, the, com the horizontal component of the normal force. Joey, got something? Bill? We can now solve the Solve the kinetics equations and the uh, normal force. Let's see, if that's theta. Then this is also theta, I believe. Is that right? So this would be n sine theta equals m b squared over rho, because that is the centripetal force. And uh, n we can then find from the fact that there's no acceleration in the z direction, which we'll take to be the up direction. So n cosine theta equals mg. And once again, N cancels and M cancels, doesn't it? So this is not dependent upon the, uh, the mass of the car, which isn't as much a concern anymore, but NASCAR rider, drivers used to be kind of hefty. All the barbecue ribs and stuff. Before light beer. All right, putting those two together, you get a theta uh, bank, bank, banking angle of, oh, check that, 27.4, 27.4 degrees. Okay, 
No different than the problem we just did. So here's the different part. Here's the different part. If the car goes a lot faster, at some time it's going to start skidding up the track. What is the maximum speed before it starts to skid up the track? Now, I'll, to do that one, I'll have to give you a coefficient of friction of some kind. We'll take it to be 90. <clears throat> so, remember that's the point at which the uh, static friction is, gives way to the kinetic friction. Kinetic friction is when the two surfaces are sliding over each other and, and the the uh, car then uh, starts to skid. So find Vmax. There's also, though, a concern if it goes too slow, then it could slide down the slope. So there's also a minimum velocity. Two separate problems. But how does this problem change then? Let's see, we don't need to do this anymore. So it's two parts. These can't be answered at the same time. So for Vmax, how does the free body diagram change? Well, the weight doesn't change. That's still there. Is there still a normal force? There must be, because it's still going in a circle. It's going in a different circle if it starts to skid up the slope, but it's still going in a circle. In fact, uh, we're looking for the point at which it starts to go up the slope. What other forces? How does it act on this free body diagram? Just have the velocity that you're looking for. For V max. If the speed's too high and it starts to slide up the track, friction would counter that and be down the track. Other than that, uh, everything's the same. It does change the normal direction some, but that is still v squared over rho. It's just we don't know what that v is. We're looking for this maximum velocity. But uh, this is before it starts to slide up the track, so the rho is the same. So let's see, get our angles right. That's theta and that's theta too, is it not? Uh, take the same angle, now that we know the angle. Use that 27.4 for the angle. Centripetal force is now a little bit different. We've got uh, n sine theta plus mu s n, because that's the friction force, cosine theta equals m v max over Vmax squared over rho. Remember, we're looking for that Vmax squared. Take theta as known now. So uh, that's two unknowns. The Actually, three, because we have the mass, the velocity, and the normal force are all unknown here at this point. 
So sum the forces in the z direction. That's n cosine theta minus mu s n. Remember, we're looking for that maximum static friction, so we are right at that limit on that. <coughs> Dave, is that okay? Were you raising your hand or just stretching? Just stretching. Okay. Didn't know if I'd uh, lost something there. Uh, actually, uh, they're going to sum to zero. So the up forces, you just put the equals there and add on mg. So I think that's two equations, two unknowns then. Because n and v are unknown. algebra now to solve it. So you can uh, go through that on your own on the weekend, but it comes out to be something like, uh, well, anybody have it? Chris, did you actually get that solved? I think I had 160 for the, for the high end, but it might be wrong. Yeah, I have 227. So I win the race, because you're going half the speed I am. But that's feet per second. So, uh, what do we have? Uh, what do we have as the velocity first? 100. Yeah. So there's still a lot of margin before uh, reaches any trouble. But it just it changed the free body diagram. We're right at the maximum static friction. That's why we can do this substitution mu s n for the friction. But we've got two equations, two unknowns. So all that's left is geometry or uh, algebra. It's not real clean algebra because here we have sine plus cosine. Here we have cosine minus sine, so it doesn't clean up real easily, but it's doable. Especially since theta is known, so it's just those are just become numbers. All right. The more interesting question is what about the minimum velocity? What's the minimum velocity where if it goes too slow, then actually slides down to the infield of the track? What changes now? There's the car, still has some weight to it. Still has some normal force, though as we saw, the normal force does change between these problems. What else? We're looking at the minimum velocity, the danger is it's sliding down the hill, so there must be some of the friction up the hill. Again, we're looking at that limit, so we can take that to be mu s times the normal force, whatever the normal force happens to be. Uh, what changes with this equation? in the normal direction. Minus. Anything? We get a minus sign right here is all, because now the, the friction is pointing in the other direction. So use the same equation in the n direct, the, the normal direction, and sine theta minus mu s and cosine theta equals 
m, and now we're looking for the minimum velocity. Remember, take theta b known, same track, 27.4. What changes in the z direction with this equation? Just these are on the same side. I believe is the only difference. And cosine theta plus mu s n. Sine theta equals mg. Does that look right? So again, it just comes down to be an algebra problem. The interesting thing here, remember you get, you'll, as you solve this, as you put theta in, you need to solve for n, you can divide through or whatever it is, you're going to end up sometime with a velocity squared as your term. You have something with the minimum velocity squared. The trouble is when you do this one, when you put in the theta, solve through the equations as you've got them, you get a negative number, which means the square root of that is imaginary. I don't happen to have what that number is. Well, I have, I have what the maximum, sorry, the minimum velocity is. Uh, I do happen to have that. I don't have what the square of it is. Uh, you get something like 70.9 i, remember i is the imaginary root, feet per second. What's that mean? you get an imaginary number, one we don't have a real solution for, what's that mean? That means it's not going to slide down. You can come to a stop and stay on the banking of the track. Now, typically in a race like this, they don't come to speeds that low to the point where they actually stop on the track and worry about sliding down. However, in uh, bicycle racing on a banked track, uh, this is actually a very shallow banking. In bicycle racing, the typical banking is closer to 45 degrees for a small track. And there is a race called the match race, where the riders are supposed to ride three laps with one rider being in the lead for the first lap, but then after that, either rider can go into the lead. The thing is, neither rider wants the lead because that rider is drafted by the second rider. So what they will do is they'll come to a stop on the track and do what's called a track stand. They'll balance there on the track, daring the other guy to take the lead because the advantage always goes to the second rider. And if the track is steep enough, with low enough coefficient of friction, one or both riders could actually fall off the track just because there's not enough friction to hold them on the banking. And they'll start their track stands and then actually slide down the track. And uh, if the upper rider, uh, rider higher up the track does it, he'll take out the lower rider. If the lower rider falls, generally the first rider cruises to the easy win. So maybe you'll see that in the Olympics this summer, some of that, uh, that matched, it's called a match race in track racing, in a bicycle track on the bottom. <laughs> Just for your interest, it turns out, and you can prove this too, the, the minimum coefficient of friction before this does become a concern is something like uh, uh, 0.52. Uh, now, remember, uh, the 0.9 is pretty typical for dry tires on dry pavement, but if these races are run in the rain, that coefficient of friction can come down, and it can come down to that. Uh, 
All right, let's see. Let's. Uh, any questions on that before we clear the board? We got just enough time to, to start a new problem, lay it out, give you something to do for the weekend, keep you out of jail. What? Question? That's about what I put it. I think I said 226, so somewhere in there. All right, so here's a different problem. Conveyor belt delivery of packages, this is the kind of thing UPS would be concerned with, delivered to a circular ramp. So we're looking at a side view of, the, of a package coming down a conveyor. Conveyor moves at some constant velocity. And neglecting friction on the ramp, so it might have little rollers or something of its own, there's a point at which the box will lose contact with the ramp because it's got enough speed and then um, has a, a free fall trajectory of its own. So find where the box loses contact with the ramp. or theta max, if you will, because after that, it's no longer in contact with the ramp. So if you were designing this and you wanted some kind of special coating or rollers along here, there's, no, there's a point beyond which there's no sense putting any more in, especially if they're cost, uh, they, they cost too much. All right, we can put some numbers to this if we'd like. 2 kilograms, the speed, 1 meter per second, and the radius of the curved ramp, half a meter. Equations of motion we can set up from a free body diagram just somewhere along the track. So anywhere along the track it's got some weight, mg, and some normal force if it's still in contact with the track. At some certain point, though, it will lose contact with the track. So let's, we've got enough time, we'll set up the equations of motion. Let's see, uh, maybe a normal and tangential components. There's the tangential direction, there's the normal direction. So force of the, some of the forces in the tangential direction. Now remember, once it gets onto this ramp without friction, it's going to be picking up speed. It will not still have this velocity that it had back here. It's going to be picking up some speed. We don't know what that is. So some of the forces in the normal direction that backwards. We'll call 
times m times some acceleration in the tangential direction and do the same thing for the normal direction and it should have components of acceleration in both of those directions because it's changing direction as it goes around the path uh, it's on a circular path when it's still in contact and at some point it, uh, it will lose contact. So in the, in the normal direction, we've got uh, that angle is the theta. Remember, we don't know what it is. We're looking for the maximum theta. So we set up the constant, the equations of motion in terms of theta. And then we can see what that becomes when we're at the limit of contact. So um, we have n minus mg cosine theta. That's this component of n in the normal direction and the component of the weight in the normal direction. What's that equal to? Now, uh, we're not at the point where we've lost contact, so it still has contact with the track. What's that equal to? I guess the choices are zero or um, some unknown acceleration or something else we might know a little more of. And this is some place where it's still in contact with the track. We'll then drive these equations to their limit and find out what theta max is. David? I think you put it on the, under the wrong heading. You have under tangential and it looks like that's a normal oh, acceleration. Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Very tiring. So. I can just make those switch there. That look better? Yeah. The, the tangential one is just simply mg sine theta. But what's that equal to? And the tangential acceleration, it's picking up speed in the tangential direction because it's falling even though it's in contact with the track to a certain point. So all we can do with that is put it as that. The uh, tangential acceleration is unknown, but it does show that the mass is not material, at least for that equation which is fewer UPS and you're designing this, that's good because boxes come in all kinds of masses. You don't want to have to sort them by weight before they even go anywhere. What's the top one equal to though? MV squared over rho. MV squared over rho. MV. But this V is not the same as this one. It's the tangential velocity and it's picking up a little bit of speed in that tangential direction. But while it's in contact, it's still in contact with, it's still going in a circular path. So it must have centripetal force. Now the deal here is to solve these <coughs> while the normal force goes to zero. Because once the normal force is zero, it's no longer in contact with the ramp. And that's the point that we were looking for. Joe, is that a hand up? Yeah. What's up? Why is, why is it n minus mg cosine theta? Would it be the other way? Like, um, oh, uh, yeah, because uh, it's in the normal direction. So. There. That fix it? Yeah.
because the normal direction is is in. Yep. In fact, there it is right there. So n drops out of this. Then once again, the mass disappears. So again, this is a, a solution that's independent of the mass. And we've only got a few minutes here, so I'll give you the part you need to finish it. Because we have three unknowns right now. Um, v is unknown. Theta is unknown. And M is unknown, I guess, technically. Uh, but M cancels out, so AT is the other number. So we have three unknowns, two equations, those right there. Again, we'll be looking for the solution when the normal force is out of the equation. So to finish it up, you have to remember that the acceleration in the tangential direction as it moves tangentially, so I'll call that S as distance along the along the path, the arc length if you will, equals V dV. Remember this, uh, this non-constant acceleration equation where the acceleration is changing with position, <coughs> which is exactly what's happening here. So the, um, you can then take, oh, there's one other little part, and that's that uh, uh, ds equals uh, rho, rho d theta. So if you put those two things together, put that into here, you can separate variables and integrate. And then put it into there. So, uh, I guess if we number them, let me make sure the right numbers. If this is equation one, this is two, and these two together, when you combine those, will be three. Just substitute ds for rho to theta. Then you can put 3 into 2, integrate, and then that goes into 1, and you can solve. Then you can solve for the maximum theta. Um, because this will give you the velocity, put the velocity in there, and then you solve for theta. <clears throat> and that's it, but I'll give you the answer so you can check it, not lose any sleep over the weekend. 42.7 degrees. Got to be careful. The, the integration is a little bit tricky. Just make sure you don't lose any of your your uh, any of the values. Remember, rho is constant. V and AT are not. Theta is not con well. Theta is constant, I guess, at the limit. That's what you're looking for. And then the mass doesn't matter.